Gibbons against Ogden, 1824. These are the facts. The Supreme Court in this case, for the first time, was asked to define the great clause of the Constitution, granting to Congress the power to regulate commerce. The root of the controversy was a monopoly created by the state of New York. For more than 20 years, the New York Steamship Company had enjoyed an exclusive grant from the state legislature to run steamships in New York water. The law provided that any other steamship company entering those waters without the consent of the company forfeited his vessel and paid a fine. The business of the monopoly flourished, but high prices and poor service soon led to resentment. Enterprising citizens of New Jersey and Connecticut also built steamships and were eager to haul passengers and freight into New York City. But they didn't like the idea of paying the steamship monopolists for the privilege. In their support, their own legislatures retaliated with laws which forbade any boat licensed by the New York grant from entering their waters. The result was that no one could transport passengers or goods between these states by steam without violating the law and subjecting his vessel to seizure. Conflicts were frequent and bitter. Thomas Gibbons was one of many who ignored the monopolists by running his boats regularly between New York and New Jersey. Aaron Ogden, a competitor who held a license from the New York company, sued Gibbons. The New York court rejected Gibbons' claim that the monopoly law was unconstitutional. Gibbons was ordered to beach his boats. With Daniel Webster pleading his case, Gibbons appealed to the Supreme Court. The argument by Daniel Webster, the attorney for Gibbons. May it please the court. One of the chief reasons for the adoption of the federal constitution was to rescue trade from the destructive effects of conflicting state laws. The aid of the constitution was to place trade under a uniform rule. The constitution limits the powers of the states in taxing imports and exports, making treaties and coining money. These restrictions would be worthless in protecting trade if a state were left with power to determine what could cross its boundaries. The Constitution gives Congress power to regulate commerce among the several states. This power must necessarily be complete and uniform. Individual states cannot legislate on the subject without producing the confusion and strife found in this case. A state statute regulating commerce among states is therefore unconstitutional. But even if the court were to read the Constitution as permitting some legislation by the states in these areas, none can doubt that state laws must yield when Congress speaks. Here, Congress has spoken. In an act passed in 1793, Congress declared that any vessel enrolled under the act and having a license is entitled to engage in coastal trade. Gibbon's vessel was enrolled and licensed. He therefore obtained a right granted by Congress under its powers to regulate commerce to engage in coastal trade. The New York law deprives him of this right. The New York law is therefore unconstitutional. The argument by the attorney for Ogden. May it please the court. The federal government is one of limited powers. These powers were derived from the sovereignty of the states. Because it limits state powers, the Constitution should be strictly construed. Only those powers found in the literal terms of the Constitution can take away the sovereign power of the several states. The Constitution does not say that Congress's power to regulate commerce is exclusive. The right to regulate commerce is essential to state government and is constantly used for the good of the people. The states are free to legislate in this area so long as they do not encroach upon a valid act of Congress. Only a direct collision between federal and state legislation justifies invalidating a state statute. The federal act relied upon by Mr. Gibbons does not declare that enrolled vessels have the right to navigate in all waters of the states, regardless of the wishes of the states in question. If it did so, it would be beyond the power of Congress. It would then be an attempt not to regulate commerce among states,
but to regulate affairs within a state. Navigation within a state's boundaries is not commerce among states. It is an internal matter over which Congress has no control. The Opinion of the Court by Mr. Chief Justice Marshall. The Constitution contains an enumeration of powers granted by the people to their government. It has been said that these powers ought to be construed strictly. But why ought they to be so construed? Is there one sentence in the Constitution which gives countenance to this rule? The rule of strict construction would explain away the Constitution of our country and leave it a magnificent structure indeed to look at, but totally unfit for use. We do not, therefore, think ourselves justified in adopting it. The words of the Constitution are, Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The subject to be regulated is commerce. Commerce undoubtedly is traffic, but it is something more. It is intercourse. It describes the commercial intercourse between nations and parts of nations and all its branches. All America understands the word commerce to comprehend navigation. It was so understood when the Constitution was framed. The power over commerce, including navigation, was one of the primary objects for which the people of America adopted their government. It has been universally admitted that the Commerce Clause covers every species of commercial intercourse between the United States and foreign nations. No sort of trade can be carried on between this country and any other to which this power does not extend. In regulating commerce with foreign nations, the power of Congress does not stop at state lines. It would be a useless power if it did. The deep streams which penetrate our country in every direction furnish the means of engaging in commerce. If Congress has the power to regulate it, that power must be exercised wherever the subject exists. If a foreign voyage may commence or terminate at a port within a state, then the power of Congress may be exercised within a state. If commerce with foreign nations includes the entire voyage, then commerce among the states must also, for the word commerce appears only once in the clause and can hardly have two meanings. Thus, navigation between states is subject to the power of Congress from the point of its beginning to the point of its completion. What is this power? It is the power to regulate, that is, to prescribe the rule by which commerce is to be governed. This power, like all others vested in Congress, is complete and acknowledges to limitations other than those prescribed in the Constitution. It has been urged, however, that the states may exercise the same power within their respective jurisdictions. With equal vigor, it is argued that full power in Congress to regulate commerce leaves no such power in the states. But whether the states have kept some power to regulate commerce until Congress acts, we need not decide. Congress has acted by licensing vessels to carry on the coastal trade. The right to engage in coastal trade is the right to make a voyage from New Jersey to New York. The laws of Congress and the laws of New York are therefore in collision. By its terms, the Constitution and laws passed thereunder are the supreme law of the land. Thus, when a state statute conflicts with a law of the nation, the state must yield. The New York law is unconstitutional and the monopoly created is void.